You've already worked with inverse, func um, inverse operations. However, we haven't worked with inverse functions yet. Um, if we think about what inverse operations are, inverse operations are operations that undo each other. For example, multiplying gets rid of one-third, adding gets rid of subtraction. Um, we can also think of it in terms of multiplicative and additive inverses where three times one-third cancel uh, each other out and become one. Negative four and four cancel each other out and become zero. Um, inverse functions, as opposed to undoing a single operation, will undo an entire function. So in order for two functions to be inverses of one another, they have to be able to cancel each other out. How does that look mathematically? Well, mathematically, here's going to be your formula. This minus 1 is read f inverse. So f of f inverse of x equals just x f inverse of f of x equals just x. So notice this is a representation of composite functions. Um, so if I'm told that f of f inverse of 2, if I'm supposed to at find out what that equals, I don't even need my functions because, or yes, I don't even need my functions because by definition, by definition, f and f inverse are going to undo or cancel each other out. So I should just be left with the value that got plugged in. Likewise, if I start with f inverse and take f inverse of f of 17, again, my f inverse and my f are going to cancel out, leaving me with just 17. It's very similar to saying 3 um, plus x and saying, hey, I can get x by itself by subtracting a 3 because they will cancel each other out and I'll be left with just my variable. But again, instead of doing a single operation, now I'm doing an entire function. So, if I want to determine if two functions are inverses of one another, I need to determine that by checking to see if when I make a composite function, do they undo each other. So, to determine if f and g are inverses, I'm going to check, does f of g of x equal x? And I'm also going to check, does g of f of x equal just x? So, starting with f of g of x, that tells me that I have f of x minus 9 over 4. Well, that means plugs x, plug x minus 9 over 4 in for f, giving me 4 times x minus 9 over 4 plus 9. Using some order of operations, I see I can cancel out my 4s, thus leaving me with x minus 9 plus 9. My minus sign and my plus line 9 come together, leaving me with just x. So in response to my initial question of does f of g of x equal x, the answer is yes. I also have to check the second one. Does g of f of x equal x? Well, what does that mean? Well, that means I have g of f of x, which is 4x plus 9, which means I'm going to plug 4x plus 9 into my g function. I always plug in with parentheses, so I have 4x plus 9 minus 9 over 4. From there, I determine if those parentheses are necessary. Because there's nothing to distribute, I'm going to see that they're not, giving me 4x plus 9 minus 9 all over 4. Well, the 9s um, add together to be 0, leaving me with just 4x over 4. My 4s cancel out, leaving me with just x. So again, in response to my initial question, does g of x um, g of f of x equal x? The answer is yes. Since both of these held true, I can say yes f of x and g of x are inverses because, again, the functions undid each other. Looking at a second example, I'm asked to determine are f of x equal to 3x squared minus 2 and g of x equal to the square root of 3x plus 2 inverses, where x is greater than or equal to 0. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and check. This is just giving me a domain for my functions. Um, so nothing to worry about there. Um, what we're going to talk about after is how to define inverse functions. And one of our steps is going to be to first determine if an inverse function exists, um, which sometimes means we're going to have to put some restraints on the domain. So for right now, um, that's just a restraint on the domain. In a, a separate video, I'll talk about where that restraint came from. Um, so going back to my original question, so if I'm determining if these are inverses, again, I'm going to ask myself, does f of g of x equal just x, as well as does g of f of x equal just x? So taking my first one, I'm going to have f of square root 3x plus 2, which gives me 3 times the square root of 3x plus 2 
squared minus 2. Well, my square and my square root cancel. However, I do have to remember to keep 3x plus 2 grouped together since it was originally grouped together under the radical. I can do that with parentheses. Whoops, this was minus, not equals. Now distributing my 3, I get 9x plus 6 minus 2. Well, that gives me 9x plus 4. I cannot simplify that any further. So I look, and since f of x did not equal x, I don't even have to check my second one. I already know the answer to this question is no, they are not inverses. It does not necessarily mean that it would, this wouldn't work, but it, they can only be inverses if they both work. So since I've already determined they're not inverses, that's why I don't have to check the second one. Moving on to the third example, this would be a good one for you to try on your own to check your understanding of inverse functions and determining if two functions are inverses with one another. Okay, now that you've had a chance to try one, I'm going to find out, does f of, does f of g of x equal x, as well as does g of f of x equal x? So starting with f of g of x, I'm going to find f of 3 over x minus 1. Well, plugging 3 over x minus 1 into my function for f of x for all variables, I have 3 over x minus 1, that's not a 1, plus 3 all over 3 over x minus 1. So that's weird. I have a bunch of little fractions. So I want to fix those little fractions. So how I'm going to do that, how I'm going to clear little fractions, for lack of a better word, is I'm going to multiply both the top and the bottom of my function by the least common denominator of my little fractions. Well, the least common denominator of my little fractions is x minus 1. So I'm going to multiply the entire top by x minus 1 and the entire bottom by x minus 1. The reason I can do that is because x minus 1 over x minus 1 is just 1. And multiplying a function by 1 does not change it. So when I do that, this x minus 1 distributes in, and I get 3 times x minus 1 all over x minus 1 plus 3 times x minus 1 all over 3 times x minus 1 over x minus 1. Well, this is helpful because... I can now cancel these x minus 1s. Doing that is effective because now I've, that, that allows my little fractions to go away, leaving me with a 3, distributing the plus 3, plus 3x three minus 3, all over 3. So I notice I can combine my 3 and minus 3, leaving me with 3x over 3, which reduces to just x. So in the response to my initial question, I can say that yes, f of g of x is just x. So I'm good there. Checking my next one, I'm gonna move my screen over just a little bit here to give myself some more room. I'm now gonna ask myself, is g of f of x equal to x? Well, that means I have g of x plus three over x. Plugging that in into g gives me three over x plus 3 over x, all minus 1. Again, it's funky to me to have that extra little, little denominator. So once again, I'm going to go ahead and say I'm going to multiply top and bottom by the least common denominator of my little fraction. Well, the least common denominator between x and no other fractions is just x. So I'm going to multiply the whole top by x and the whole bottom by x. Again, that means I'm going to have to distribute, giving me 3x on top, x times x plus 3 over x on the bottom minus x times 1. Well, again, this is helpful because my x's cancel, and I now don't have some funky little fraction inside of my larger fraction. From here, I see that my x is on the bottom combined to be 0, leaving me with 3x over 3. I reduce my 3s, and once again, I can answer my initial question by saying yes. g of f of x did equal x. So make sure that you do check both, um, and it is just making a composite function between my two functions and seeing if I get x back in order to determine if two functions are inverses of one another.